I'd like to welcome everybody to the November 5th, 2020 meeting of the Salt Lake City Historic Landmarks Commission. And as we begin this meeting, I need to read a statement. I, Kenton Peters, Historic Landmark Commission Chair, hereby determine that conducting the Salt Lake City Historic Landmark Commission meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. No. The World Health Organization, the President of the United States, the Governor of Utah, the Salt Lake County Health Department, Salt Lake County Mayor, and the Mayor of Salt Lake City have all recognized a global pandemic exists related to the new strain of the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Due to the state of the emergency caused by the global pandemic, I find that conducting a meeting at an anchor location under the current state of public health emergency constitutes a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the location. Moreover, the city and county building, which is the anchor location for Salt Lake City Historic Landmark Commission meetings, is presently closed for regular occupation due to damages sustained during the March 2020 earthquakes. Okay. That said, uh, move the president of the United States part of that. Uh, David, you're kind of um, muted there a little bit. Can you speak up? Oh, nothing for nothing important. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If I make a quick announcement for the public that may be watching. Yes, please um, go ahead, Michaela. This is November 5th, the Historic Landmark Commission. Um, for those that are at home, you can join this electronic meeting. You can input, input this direct link into your web browser that I'm sharing on the screen. Um, when I'm done sharing, you can also visit our website at www.slc.gov slash boards, and then go to Historic Landmark Commission agendas and minutes and find a link to this meeting. If you haven't joined an electronic meeting before, we also have some instructions there on how to um, join the meeting virtually. If you have major issues or you have comments, we are also looking at our email. Please feel free to email us at historic landmarks at comment, sorry, historic landmarks dot comment at slcgov.com and we will respond back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. I've got one more boilerplate statement to read before we can get on to tonight's program. Welcome to the Historic Landmark Commission. The Historic Landmark Commission is made up of citizens of the city who are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. The commission primarily does three things. We make recommendations to the city council on policies and ordinances related to preservation in Salt Lake City. This includes the designation of local historic districts and landmark sites. As a certified local government, provide input to the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO, regarding national register nominations within the city. We are also charged with reviewing and making decisions on land use applications for properties that are located within the Historic Preservation Overlay District. This includes design review of building alterations, demolitions, economic hardship requests, construction of new buildings, special exceptions, and historic building relocation. It is up to the applicant to present their project and provide evidence that shows how their project complies with the specific standards of review. The planning staff is here to let us know why we are reviewing an application what standards we need to use in making a decision and point out the key issues. The role of the public is to help us identify the issues and impacts of a proposed project and provide input on how they think the project complies or does not comply with the standards of review for which the Historic Landmark Commission has authority over. On items where the city council is the decision maker, opinions may be considered. Our goal is to have a welcoming and safe environment for everyone. To reach that goal, we ask that those in attendance adhere to a few ground rules. Please mute your microphones when you are not speaking. Um, 
if you wish to speak, uh, I believe you can put your put your hand up or contact Michaela of staff and uh, keep your comments on topic and succinct. All right, thank you very much. We will now move into the agenda for the meeting. Uh, first of all, uh, we need approval of the minutes for October 1st, 2020. So moved, Richardson. Uh, Commissioner Richardson has made a motion to approve those minutes. Do we have a second? Commissioner Ashler, second. Mr. All Chair, right. Our, uh, our three new commissioners should abstain on this vote. Oh, sure. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, very good then. Uh, just take a, uh, a vote. Uh, we've, had, we've had a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Um, Robert? I, I approve. And uh, <clears throat> David? Approved. Victoria? Victoria, uh, cast your vote, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Mike, can you hear us? Um, we'll come back to him, Robert. That's that's an affirmative vote. Sorry, Mike, can you hear me now? Mike gave us Very a thumbs good. up. Okay, Sorry, excellent. The minutes. Thank you. The minutes are approved. Um, report of the chair. Uh, first of all, as has been mentioned, we welcome three new members to the commission tonight. Babs DeLay, John Iwanowski, and Aidan Lilly. Welcome to the Historic Landmarks Commission. We are excited to have you here and look forward to your enthusiastic participation. Uh, second is that the last item tonight is going to be uh, election of new chair. This is my last, my last uh, meeting as chairman after doing it for two years. And so uh, be considering who you might want to nominate to take over for chair and vice chair positions. Robert, have you got anything to add? I don't, Kenton, thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you. We thank will you. then uh, move into the director's report. Michaela, or oh, Nick, have you got anything for us? I have one item. Um, the Land Commission had requested badges since it's getting darker and as contentious it is if you're out and about um, looking at properties I think especially since we're going into fall and winter I believe Marlene sent you out an email but we'll be sending you out an email to contact HR and they if you're interested in having a badge um, they have all the machinery to take your picture give you a handy dandy badge so you can be official in case uh, need to present that to someone. So just wanted to pass that along. Thank Are you. Are they TSA Thanks. approved? <laughs> we're, gonna gold, we're gonna put a gold star on yours. Yeah. All right, thanks, Michaela. Thanks for moving that forward. I think that'll be helpful for all of us. Uh, public comment time, is there any? Buddy out there in uh, internet land and the public who would like to speak to uh, any items not pertaining to tonight's agenda items. I do not see any hands coming up um, for the people who are in attendance. Okay. Remind people how to raise a hand. Oh, yeah. Um, next to your name in your participant list, attendee list, there's there should be a little, a small, unfortunately, it's super small, little icon that looks like a hand. If you click on that, it will indicate to us that you want to speak on an item. So 
you'll have a few, we have three items, on, three public hearings on the agenda, plus the general comment section. Um, so if you want to try that, you can, you can do that. If you click on it once, it'll bring it, it'll show us the hand. If you click on it a second time, your hand will disappear. So if you do it, we may remind you uh, to, after you speak to, to um, lower that. If you are having any kind of issue finding that icon or using it, you can also type in a, into the Q and A a uh, question for us, and we can um, and let us know that you want to speak, or you can send an email to the HLC comments email that um, we mentioned earlier. And uh, I think with that, we'll uh, turn it over back to you, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Nick. Okay, we'll move into the first item. Fisher Mansion Carriage House Chemical Coating, located at approximately 1206 West, 200 South. Uh, Kelsey is the planner. Let her proceed. Hey, Good Ken, I just wanna jump in and say I'm gonna recuse for this agenda oh, item, so. Thank you, thank you, John. And then we'll hear from you in a few minutes, I guess. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Just one moment while I get everything set up. Okay. So this is for the Fisher Mansion Carriage House, a chemical coating request. Uh, CRSA on behalf of Salt Lake City Parks and Public Lands is requesting a major alteration to the carriage house associated with the Fisher Mansion. This property is located at 1206 West, 200 South, and is designated as a Salt Lake City landmark. The applicant is requesting to administer an anti-graffiti coating to the exterior of the carriage house to protect from tagging. Um, as noted, the subject property is located on 1206 West, 200 South, and is located just north of the mansion, which faces 200 South. The property abuts the Jordan River on the West and I-80 to the South. The following are existing photos of the carriage house, um, as many of you are familiar. This is the South Elevation, the east elevation, uh, yeah, again, my terrible shot of the west elevation and the north. The applicant applied a test area to the west elevation, which faces the Jordan River. And uh, the photo highlights the test area on the, um, highlights the subject area that was tested. The key considerations that were identified in the staff report include um, the alteration of the appearance of the historic masonry. Staff's main concern with um, any sort of anti-graffiti coating or chemical coating is the potential impact to the visual nature of the historic masonry. Uh, chemical coatings can often alter the color and the sheen of masonry. However, looking at the test sample that the applicant provided, it is difficult to see a visual alteration on the masonry in this test area. The other key consideration identified was the location of the structure and the likelihood of tagging. Parks and public lands have expressed a significant concern over the likelihood of this structure being tagged. The Fisher Mansion has been tagged um, at least on one occasion during the duration of the city's ownership. The city does have a graffiti removal team uh, that does remove any tags from city owned buildings, uh, which they try to do with the gentlest means possible. But it, it does cause damage to the masonry, uh, which can be seen on the Fisher Mansion um, where it's been tagged. While staff does not readily approve chemical coatings on historic masonry, uh, this situation is different because the structure is particularly vulnerable in its location. 
and it is likely to experience some vandalism until there are more eyes on the main mansion and the carriage house. Staff does believe that this is likely a temporary solution due to the sacrificial nature of this type of coding. Um, and in summary, staff is recommending that the Landmark Commission approve the recoding to the Landmark site uh, at 1206 West 200 South. And that was short and sweet. I'm happy to answer any questions or go back through any photos. Yeah, commissioners, please feel free to ask Kelsey questions if you have them. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Chelsea, this is Michael. Uh, when you say sacrificial coating, does that really mean that, that every four to five years the coating would have to be reapplied? That is a great question for Zach Clegg. From my understanding, the coating is removed when the building is tagged. So that's what's removed if they need to remove any sort of graffiti on the coating, which is why it's considered sacrificial. So it, it's not a, a permanent coating. It doesn't seep, seep into the brick itself. It's more of a surface. I don't know. That's right, Thank Kelsey. You. Thanks to that. <laughs> and Babs, you have a question. Or Commissioner DeLay. I apologize. Commissioner DeLay. So <laughs> what um oh, no. got to keep this formal. <laughs> well, it's kind of like being share. It's just share, you know, it's just Babs. Um <laughs> Uh, what is what is the coding? Because I would love to know that in my own world. And I remember all the grandiose dreams of this place and the city had it. We had a grand opening and I remember the wonderful stained glass window we had. And oh, yeah. what, when did it close? I was totally clueless that it had it closed. And then I drove by it and saw it was boarded up. So just a little bit of history. And then what is that chemical? And why are we opposed to that chemical? Of course. So I'll give you a little bit of history. The main mansion is not included in this proposal because uh, there's no funding for a reuse of the main mansion at this point. Okay. This is only for the carriage house. So the carriage house came before the landmark commission this summer through a work session and then received approval for an adaptive reuse for a uh, community and river engagement center, recreation center. And Tyler can correct me and kind of provide the programming behind the center. But the exterior it has very minimal um, modifications that were approved by Landmark. It includes, uh, sorry, I thought I heard somebody. It just includes uh, two big modifications to the east elevation and the south for additional space and some entrance. Otherwise, they're, they're keeping the building as is and restoring the exterior. Mm -hmm. Typically, preservation philosophy and principles are not keen on approving chemical coatings on historic masonry. Just because of those items mentioned in the staff report, it can alter the sheen, it can trap moisture, it can cause damage to the brick and the mortar. Um, this chemical is a Prosoco chemical, which Zach, the applicant, can go into. It has, um, uh, I think, quite a large market for anti-graffiti coatings and um, quite a large use as, as well as in historic structures, which is why they provided a, a test area to see if there would be any sort of alteration of the existing masonry. Interesting, thank you. Of course. Are there any other... Are there any other um, like crime mitigation things being put in like cameras or are we planning for extra patrols near there or anything or harm reduction measures? Sure. I will allow uh, Tyler Murdoch to address that. Yeah, applicants, do you want to go ahead and make your presentation and then we can respond to questions from the commissioners, including Victoria's? Sure. Yeah, that was. You, oh, you take it, Tyler. <laughs> oh no, you go go ahead, Zach. I'll answer the question following that. Okay, so um, yeah, Kelsey did. My name is Zach Clegg. I work with CRSA. Um, I'm kind of filling in for John now that he is on the committee. Uh, the Kelsey did a great job, kind of introducing why we um, are at this point of introducing this coding to the carriage house. 
Um, the the product Babs for your record is a Prosoco Sure Clean Block Guard and Graffiti Control Number Two. Um, so that's the actual uh, name of the product that we are proposing for the the carriage house. Um, any other buildings? Sorry. Do we use it on any other buildings? So this was a product that had come um, with recommendation from Zane Badger. He's the in charge of the city's uh, graffiti program. So I think I can't remember off the top of my head if there are any other buildings in Salt Lake that are using this product, but it was come re it came recommended uh, from Zane Badger with the city. Okay. So I'll let Tyler kind of answer that quick question before we you know, get too far into that, but. Yeah, I can jump in there. Uh, certainly we, we do use this on a lot of other uh, buildings, restrooms in, in parks. Um, I'm not really sure of any specific buildings uh, with a historic nature that we are currently using it on, however. Yeah. All right. Um, there was one thing that I wanted to add to Kelsey's introduction. So we do have some, uh, well, first off, we did um, send out kind of a map for um, the commissioners to go actually check out if they had the chance to look at the um, what has happened on the mansion itself by the entrance and then what happened once they removed the graffiti and then also to look at the test site on the west side of the carriage house. So um, for those that, that haven't had a chance or, you know, with the new commissioners, um, I do have a slide deck it does show those photos. Um, my share button right now is currently grayed out, but I, if I'm able to, I can share those those images to help there. Yeah, that'd be helpful to see those. Can uh, Nick or someone let him share those uh, slides, please? Uh, I'm looking, I don't know, let's see. I know the we're- changes. Yeah. That's working. Okay, it says share file or new whiteboard. Is there a way to just share my screen? Uh, yeah, yeah. The bottom of the screen, there's the share button. Uh huh. If you you're gonna want to, I think, share the file, and it should give you show you what files you have open. I believe. Okay. So let's try that. Um. Okay, so we actually at our, our firm we use a a, a cloud um, kind of a remote access with our thing. So my file is actually I can only show it through my screen. I know Kelsey, are you able to pull that up by chance? And I know I sent it over to you. You just, do. I, Give me just a moment, and I'll pull it up for you. Yeah, that would be great. Um, anyways, I can kind of talk about it while she's getting into that. So one of the main concerns. Um, with what's previously occurred with graffiti at the mansion is that when um, the graffiti was removed from the brick um, as gently as possible, what it does, it, it kind of leaves like some pretty significant damage to the brick um, in the form of creating stippling in the brick and a, okay, so right here. So um, this first image shows um, to the right is an area that previously had um, graffiti on it and it was cleaned and removed. So you can see a pretty stark difference of kind of where the brick is starting to pit. Um, Zane told us that this brick that is used on both the mansion and the carriage house is very soft in nature, which we've um, really seen throughout um, both facades. And so the damage there uh, is pretty significant. If you go to the next slide, Kelsey, it kind of shows overall, you can see up above um, that area hasn't been tagged. And then as you move down, you kind of get to see more kind of blotchy areas where graffiti has been removed. So um, one of the considerations, you know, is that we're adding a coating to the brick, which does ultimately add a slight, very um, pretty insignificant change to the appearance of the brick. But in comparison to what currently is on there, which is nothing, and kind of the process of taking the, the graffiti off it, it really does create a more permanent lasting difference. So if you go to the final uh, slide there, Kelsey. So this shows um, kind of up close the, the test area that we did. So we did it on one of the sills and then also the brick that's on the carriage house. So you can see to the left, 
it is a slightly darker um, appearance and that's where the Prosoco has been applied and then the right being an untouched area. So that's kind of what the whole um, carriage house would appear as once we do if we were to use this coating on there. And then like Kelsey said, it is a sacrificial coating. So it would remain on the carriage house until um, it was, if in the event that it is tagged, then when they are cleaning off the, the graffiti, you know, with like a uh, uh, pressure washer and water, it would remove the coating, so they would need to then reapply it um, for future, in case of future vandalism there. So um, the good thing about that is that in the long run, it is not a permanent uh, coating. Like Kelsey said, something that would seep in and kind of change the, you know, the physical makeup of the shell of the building. And also, you know, in the future, if um, like what was mentioned, if, you know, kind of more eyes on the street, this area becomes less of a risk, you know, it is something that we can reverse and take off um, to get it to its truly authentic appearance there. So that's kind of the spiel with the, um, the graffiti coating. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, not, this is not really about the coating it's itself, but Victoria, uh, do you want to repeat your question, please? Are there going to be any other um, any other security measures implemented, like cameras or patrols or harm reduction programs or things, or are we only relying on this to deter? Yeah, I can answer that. That's a great question. Uh, there will be a few other measures that we'll be taking uh, when this eventually opens to the public. Uh, right now, the site is fenced along the Jordan River Parkway Trail. When this project is complete, we will have a gate that will be provide public access from the Jordan River Parkway Trail to the Fisher Mansion and the Carriage House. So we do anticipate a lot more activity at the Carriage House. We will install uh, cameras on the building, and that is primarily because this building will be used uh, partially for office space for some of our outreach team. Um, so that it will have cameras. In addition to that, uh, we do regular patrols along the Jordan River Parkway Trail with law enforcement, um, but uh, you know, to be frank, the funding for those patrols kind of ebbs and flows. And so we can't always guarantee that we have regular patrols in this area. Great. Thank you. Uh, are there questions for the applicants, Debs? Um, is there, is, is that the Jordan River right there? Are we planning in long term? to have that as a um, docking area for kayaks and what have you, and then people would come out to the Fisher Mansion. What is the long-term idea here? Yeah, that's a great question as well. And uh, yes, we, we just broke ground and started construction last week or this week, I believe, uh, for the new boat ramp that will be adjacent to the carriage house itself. Uh, so, yes, that is a long term plan is to activate this space along with the boat ramp here into the future. We're currently exploring the opportunity to have a, a canoe share kayak rental program that we would run out of this area as well. Uh, but we're currently just in the feasibility phase of that study. Right. Commissioners, are there any other questions for the applicants? Aiden, please proceed. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the removal of the graffiti. Um, so Zach said that with this current chemical that they're that we're discussing, um, adding to the Fisher Mansion, that it will be removed with a light um, power wash, which is also in the staff report. I saw that written. Um, but I was just wondering in the description of the chemical, it's listing for graffiti removal two different products. Um, one is called defacer, it says defacer eraser, and then the other is the EnviroClean staff strip. So I was just curious if it's been, if we like know that it's been removed with just water or if those chemicals um, that say, they can cause damage to windows or other things that are listed here if those would be used or if it would actually be just water in the power wash. 
So my understanding is that um, it kind of depends on the level of the graffiti and like if it's how long it's been on the surface, you know, kind of allowing it to dry and whatnot. So I believe that, you know, initially that it's kind of a, the first step is to go as lightly as possible and invasively as uh, least invasive as possible. So that would be just like simply using water. Sometimes they use like a water soap kind of mixture. And then the next two, um, those two products that are used for the removal, I, I believe are more kind of extreme cases that um, we, we really don't envision happening too much just because of the high use that this will have um, moving forward. It's, you know, it's not gonna sit there for weeks unnoticed uh, basically, but uh, Tyler, do you know, again, I apologize, John was kind of our expert on this and then things kind of switched a little bit, but um, so we're trying to fill in the gap there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can sp speak to that briefly as well. So in our site visit with our graffiti manager and his team, uh, one of the real benefits that we see of adding the graffiti coating is they, they are able to use a softer uh, treatment for removal. So uh, during that visit, it, he, he mentioned if we're able to get this Prosoco on there, it, he essentially would be able to use soap and water to remove it. Chemical treatment is primarily used when we don't have any type of treatment and it, it requires a more rigorous approach. So on this location specifically, we would definitely start with a more minimal soap and water treatment. Okay. Um, and I was also wondering what the current processes are. Are they currently removing it like with abrasive means or what, what has been happening to the historic brick? Uh, that's a really good question, and I, I don't know that I can answer it entirely, but based on that site visit that we held with our graffiti team, when they have had graffiti on site to date, they have primarily used a pressure washer um, to remove that. And so, and I think in order to get that removed without a coating, they have to use a pretty high pressure. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of the pitting that we saw in those images. Uh, and it's my understanding if we're able to have that coating, we can reduce that pressure significantly to avoid the, that pitting problem. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Zach, for stepping in for and answering these questions. I understand that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right, good questions and answers. Uh, Babs, I see your hand waving. But except we can't hear you, Babs. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud. I just recall going to the mansion before. Has it ever been, it, it doesn't seem like it's been sandblasted. What is the nature of the brick there? What's it made out of? Um, so like the, the carriage house there, it's, they're both basically a very, um, I mean, it's an 1890s structure. So the kind of the makeup of the brick and the mortar is pretty, pretty rudimentary. Um, it's a soft clay brick. I don't believe that there's been any sandblasting on it, um, at least since the city has has had uh, ownership of the building. So it still has that kind of somewhat hard coat on it. It, it does, but I mean, just over the years and stuff, if, if you were to go there and look on site, it's pretty mm -hmm. evident that just even, you know, kind of the, the yearly wear and tear with weather and, and things like that have really done a number on it. So um, there are a few spots that kind of do seem to have the original historic um, appearance of it, but ultimately, especially on the carriage house, it's, it's, you can tell that it's been pretty weathered. Yeah. The brick is in, is in pretty good condition. There is, like Zach said, some weathering and then water damage. They incorporated quite a bit of masonry repair and repointing in the approved adaptive reuse for the exterior changes. So. And that will also incorporate, I believe, like a very light cleaning of this brick before they apply the Prosoco. Yeah, there would be a yeah. initial cleaning before applying that. Now, like Kelsey said, it's it's most of it is just mainly cosmetic. Um, there was a little bit of damage that occurred from the earthquake, but overall it's it's in actually pretty good condition. David. Yeah, can, um, this question may be for Zach. Um, are there coatings presently on the primary structure, the Fisher Mansion itself? 
Um, currently, there's nothing on either structure. So that's um, the, the carriage house. We don't have any signs that it's been tagged necessarily. Um, but the mansion, that's what those first few sh photos were showing that um, it has been tagged pretty recently, actually. And then just the kind of damage that occurred from, you know, getting removing that from the, the, the brick itself. So it is a very soft brick. So it's prone to kind of a seeping in and taking in that paint a lot more, which ultimately is causing more of the pitting and kind of discoloration and change in appearance um, from the untagged areas. Thank you. And this is actually was a little bit of a leading question, which is um, if funds were available, would the city also want to use a similar coating on the primary structure, the Fisher Mansion itself? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I would I would hope just kind of seeing what's happened. You know, I know it's not the first response or kind of solution with a historic building, but I think just given the location of it and what's already happened, I think it is, you know, it is partial to this kind of vandalism. Thank you. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions for the applicant and staff, uh, we'll now open this up to comments from the public, if there are any. We Nick, do, do you see anything? Uh, we do. Um, we have a comment from Soren Simonson. Soren, you're unmuted. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can. Loud and clear, Soren. Great. Appreciate it. Well, I'm uh, excited to see this project continue moving forward. Just a little bit of background. I know some of you know me from different contexts. I'm currently the executive director for the Jordan River Commission, where I've been uh, serving for uh, the last about three and a half years and have been working uh, with Salt Lake City to support this project as it moves forward to create an active node at the Fisher Mansion site. And uh, while I know there may be some concerns with this coding, um, I also know that uh, activating this property will be probably one of the best deterrents to future tagging and vandalism and other things that we've seen in the area. We've seen this in a lot of different locations where creating more active uses and um, activities uh, along the lines of the boat launch and um, education center and office and other things that are planned as part of this project. I think will be a great deterrent to future uh, issues with vandalism and tagging and those sorts of things. Um, I don't know if, if everyone knows, but there's also a really significant um, initiative that's uh, launching um, Rocky Mountain Power just in the last month has announced that they are in the process of slowly decommissioning this uh, power plant. Uh, that's just across the river um, to the north and west of this property. There are other properties for sale around this. And just recently, the State Fair Park also announced the release of an RFP to find a developer to develop the white ball field, which is the property just to the north of the railroad tracks from the Fisher Mansion. So I know this property has been in an industrial area for quite some time and uh, i'm hopeful to see over the next decade that this area might really transition into a real really amazing center for activity for urban neighborhood um, restoration of uh, and, and daylighting of city creek and the Folsom creek uh, and, and trail corridor it's just a real hub of future activity and preserving this structure while that happens i think is really important to its future so uh, thanks for allowing me to, to make a few comments and I encourage you to support this and help us move this project forward. Yeah, thank you, Thorin. Anybody else out there, Nick? Uh, I do not see any other hands going up and I do not see that we've received any um, emails to the um, public comment email address on this item. Can I call Thank you. call for the question? Uh, do you want another question for the applicant, Babs? No, can I call for the question? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, can we vote? Call for a motion. We need to go into, 
Well, we need to give the applicant one more chance to respond to the public comment. All right. And then we'll move into executive session. And at that point, we can vote. Uh, so, applicant, anything else to add? Yeah, I would just echo what Soren said. I think this um, solution that we have for this, the, the great thing about it is that it's not a permanent solution. So, um, you know, the goal is that one day that this won't be needed. Um, that's kind of the ideal situation. But I think until then, you know, just making sure that there's no further deterioration to the facades of um, the carriage house uh, is kind of our, our main priority. So, um, I'll leave it at that unless Tyler has anything he wants to add. I don't have anything else. Thanks, Zach. Very good. Okay. We will now move into executive session. And Babs, if you are so inclined, you could uh, go ahead with the motion. You are muted, Babs. I am. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Just Let me like take those presidential debates. Right. Uh, yeah. Just to go ahead ver uh, on uh, item number one, Fish and Man Fisher Mansion Carriage House Chemical Coating at approximately 1206 West, 200 South. I move that we approve this request. Is that appropriate protocol? Yeah. Would you add the case uh, number, you, please? You, you need to state the basis for. Um, the motion. Uh, well, there's, uh, there's a suggested motion in our packet here. Um, but, um, David, uh, we're having a hard time hearing you. There's a suggested motion in our packet. Can you hear me better when I speak that way? Yeah, David, why don't you make the motion? I'll defer to you. Oh, okay, I want a, a quick discussion um, first, and that is I'm wondering if we should expand this motion a little bit to encompass the entire property rather than just the, this one accessory building. Um, if the other commissioners um, would feel comfortable with allowing the city at its discretion to use similar coatings on all buildings on this parcel. Hmm. Commissioners, did you hear uh, David's suggestion? That, that that's going to depend on how specific the uh, agenda indicates uh, the petition, so the scope of the petition. So if it, if the agenda says, the notice says that it's just for the accessory structure, um, then you're going beyond the scope of what was noticed uh, by approving more than that. Oh, okay. To Paul's point, that the agenda does say. Fisher Mansion Carriage House, uh, to which end, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during our public hearing, I move that the commission approve petition number PLNHLC 2020-509 for a request for a certificate of appropriateness for the major alteration, which is a chemical coating, of the carriage house structure at 1206 West 200 South. Very good. Thank you, David. We have a motion for approval. Do we have a second on that motion? I second that. Uh, that was Mike. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Um, I will go down the list for a vote. Babs? Approve. Uh, John is not here for this one. Robert? Approved. Aiden? Approved. Victoria? Yes. Uh, David? I approve. And Mike? Approved. Very good. That motion passes unanimously. And uh, thank you very much to Kelsey and the presenters. We will now move to item number two. Harvard Avenue landscape alterations at approximately 1362 East Harvard Avenue. Uh, Nelson Knight is our planner. Please, oh, can someone, uh, we need to get John back in the, in the meeting here. Can 
someone uh, <laughs> give him a call? I'm yeah. back. I'm back. Oh, hey. Okay. Welcome. Now, how do I know you weren't just sitting outside the door with listening through the crack? Okay. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> All right, Nelson. Uh, you're up. Nelson, I think you're there right. There you oh, go. Sorry. Are we better? Perfect. All right. Okay. It's always an adventure. Okay. Um, so this is a, a project at 1362 Harvard Avenue. Um, Dean and Essie, uh, who is landscape designer on behalf of the property owners, Joan Hammond and Joe Dick. Um, uh, Mr. Dick will be speaking with us. I see him on the screen there. Uh, is requesting approval from the city for site grading, landscaping, and a 20 inch high stone veneer wall, which was installed at the front yard at this house without a certificate of appropriateness. And it's a contributing building within the Salt Lake City Harvard Heights Historic District and is zoned R1 7000 single family residential. Um, the keyboard's a little wonky here. Um, so, just kind of place this in space in the vicinity here. Uh, the Harvard Heights district runs from 13th East to 15th East along uh, Harvard, Princeton, and a portion of Laird Avenue. It is a portion of the original Normandy Heights subdivision, which was created in 1926. Uh, and the, you can see the, the building here. Um, there are at the time of designation, there were 46 buildings, um, of which 42 were considered contributing uh, to the district. So um, they're mostly uh, period revival style, fairly large stately homes. Um, this is this is the, the home here. Um, it's typical, it was built in 1928 um, and uh, shows a lot of the the revival style architecture details that are typical of the building. Um, it's it's important to note here that there were this this project did come in for several approvals and several special exceptions, um, and so the the work really is at issue here is only the work that was done in the front yard. Um, that's that's a current view uh, with the the wall in the front that was installed. Um, originally, you can't really, we didn't have any before photos that showed the, the slope very well, but as part of the design of this subdivision, there was a build to line and the uh, deed restrictions called out for a kind of a sloping, gradual slope from the front wall or the porch of the house down to the sidewalk. And that's evident in a number of places around a um, little bit of the background here. So, as I mentioned, we the the planning staff did issue certificates of appropriateness and two special exceptions uh, during design work on the house and permitting. Um, they were for the house, uh, an accessory structure in the rear yard and backyard changes. Um, the work was excluded from the front yard. Um, that one uh, was was under construction. Uh, on August 18th, the city received a call and an enforcement officer went up and took a look at it. Uh, later, a building off inspector during the day uh, told the contractor to, that they needed to obtain a, CO, a certificate of appropriateness and to um, that any work that they were doing after that was at their own risk. Um, however, work continued and so on the, the 27th, uh, there was a stop work order posted by another building inspector. Uh, and at that point, the, the contractor um, for the owners contacted the city and uh, put in a request for a certificate of appropriateness. Um, the, there was a little back and forth between the city staff and, and uh, the contractor. There, the, the stop work order remained on the property 
Um, the planning staff visited the, the site on September 11th and, um, and determined that it would not meet standards uh, in terms of the applicant and uh, said that if it went to the commission, there would be a, a denial, a potential denial, um, and a recommendation from the staff for denial. Uh, on, apparently, work com continued, and um, there was another complaint called in uh, by October 12th. Another building inspector returned, and at that point, the work was essentially complete. So we're looking at a complete project now, which is, has benefits that you can see the effect. Um, and, and make that decision on your own. Um, we're not, we have photos here, um, but give you a little bit of context here. As I said, it's part of Normandy Heights subdivision. Uh, the lot is noticed there. It's on Harvard Avenue across the street is Normandy Circle, which is a separate uh, local historic district within the larger Yale Crest National Historic District. Um, and you can see here from the historic photo, this was actually taken further east than the subject property. But, um, you know, the, there was a pattern of these sloping yards going up from the street up to the, up to the front of the house. And that was, that was intentionally designed into the design of the, the subdivision when it was created. Um, it reflected the kind of move toward picturesque uh, design styles and a, a more uh, country, suburban design away from the, the gridiron street blocks that were typically popular, particularly in Salt Lake, prior to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, there's some additional photos are when work was still under construction. This is a corner shot. Um, there is still a slope. There's the the wall is is 20 inch high, 20 inches high, right up against the uh, sidewalk, and you can see that there. Um, the major major point at issue here is detailed in the staff report, um, but in the design guidelines. Uh, great changes, it's very clear that they need to be carefully, carefully considered. Uh, and I'm just pulling out a quote from there here. A new retaining wall will affect the character of the streetscape. This should not be considered in its immediate and then broad, this should be considered in its immediate and then broader context, where a new retaining wall interrupts an established pattern of gradual grading of French lawns that will be less visually and historically appropriate. Um, there, there are other design guidelines listed in the staff report that I won't get into. Uh, that's kind of a summary there. And you see another photo of the, the wall. Um, this is to give you some context. Um, these photos are looking east. Um, you can see that there have, I mean, by and large, there's still a generally st sloping character to this street, um, particularly on this side of the street. Uh, and you can see the wall there, how it fits in within that streetscape. This is now looking more west. Um, you can see, uh, again, the same slope, especially in the, in the bottom photos, you see as you look down toward, there's, a, there's kind of a uniform slope around that. Now, that is not to say that there aren't other examples, uh, even within the district, nearby across the street that are um, have changed this pattern over the course of time. Um, when this district, uh, excuse me, district was created, uh, one of the distinguishing features of, of the district that was called out was this, uh, this landscaping approach. But it's been, uh, it's been changed several times. This is another uh, retaining wall in the district and then the lower photo is a retaining wall that is actually right across the street from the subject property. So, so there are interruptions. Um, in terms of the standards, there's a full analysis again. Um, the, the residential design guidelines, uh, again, talk about being site features, the, the existing grade of the, the site, 
to be retained, um, retaining walls that interrupt that historic grade um, are, are not appropriate. Uh, and so in our findings, there were we, we found that there were conflicts with five of the findings. That's in the, uh, the attachment, I think it's E of your staff report that goes into more detail on that. So um, our recommendation here is, is based purely on, on the design guidelines and the standards. It's our, our, our opinion that those proposals don't meet the objectives of those standards. Um, uh, clearly, design standards two, five, eight, and nine, and uh, the, the design guidelines is listed in the staff report. Um, we would recommend that the historic landmark the commission deny the certificate of appropriateness for the landscaping. Um, we will work with the applicant uh, if, at your direction, but if um, if you find this way, then we would work to find a solution that will meet the standards. Um, we recommend that you delegate that for administrative approval. Thank you, Thank you Nelson. Uh, Commission, any questions for uh, staff before we ask the applicant to speak? Mm -hmm. Babs? I have two. Um, first of all, you can see the slope history if you just Google the address in Zillow, um, it will show up. Um, that's where I found it. And I was I was quite interested to learn that a landscape like that in that area was uh, intentional. So given that he's, uh, they have already put in this small fence, for lack of a better term, what would be, what would happen next if we denied this? Would we make them tear it out? Would they have to cut it in half? What are, what are the options here? I want to see it being my first meeting here, what would be happening uh, when if we were to deny this based on the staff recommendation? Well, it's it's an unfortunate situation in that um, we continued after it was initially brought to the attention of the contractor and um, and the city. Uh, it, when when the work was initially, I guess, flagged or stopped, the, the, the wall wasn't completed at that time. Um, there, we had folks at the application that show it, it was just a foundation, cinder block foundation at that point. Um, so the, I, I would guess that based on the standards, they would need to remove the wall and regrade the property. Um, the, the applicant has a pretty comprehensive uh, presentation on the, the, the hydrological and the other drainage issues involved. Um, we chose not to get too involved in that because he seems to have a pretty good grasp of them. And um, I, I don't, <laughs> and planning staff doesn't. So um, that would, we would want to address his concerns in a solution. Um, and and that may be removing the wall. Uh, if it were to retain a, some some sort of wall or something like that, we would probably bring it back to the commission. The we would be looking for a restoration of the original grade, I guess. Very good. Thanks, Nelson. You're welcome, commissioners. Any other any other questions for Nelson? I have a couple. Yes, um, is, this, is this John? I don't see on my screen here. Yeah, yeah, this is John. Okay, please proceed. Um, I I wanted to clarify. So the retaining walls in the area are not historic. I I walked the site yesterday, and there are a handful of of like, technically not retaining walls, but they're retaining walls. Yeah. <laughs> um. And then are the street trees, the original trees, the same ones that we can see in the 1933 photo? Not after that storm. <laughs> there was quite a good well, there's a lot of trees still and yeah. Um, there was quite a bit of damage after the storm. I, you know, I'm not, 
up on my uh, trees. I'm a buildings guy, um, but but I would I would guess that most of the street trees are original. Um, there have been some infill trees over time. Um, and then one more question: What um, you said something about how the the cul-de-sac across the street is a separate local historic district? Are there are these all grouped under the Yalecrest National District? Then how does this how does that work? Yeah, if you if you recall or you may not recall, um, at one point in the city, after that was made a National Register Historic District, which doesn't require any review from from landmark commission or city staff for changes. Um, the city made it a local historic district. There was a lot of pushback uh, from the neighborhood. Um, it became a legislative issue. Uh, the legislature changed parts of state code that involved this. And uh, eventually the city settled on a district designation process where it was focused on much smaller pieces of that original Yalecrest neighborhood. So this this neighborhood organization had to, uh, to pass a fairly high bar uh, of support for this particular historic district. Um, several times they were they were pulled and they were they got to vote, uh, and then just this section here was made a local district in 2016, I believe. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, shall we proceed now to, the, oh, Aiden, did you have a question? Just a quick question, yes. Um, Nelson, I'm not sure if you would know this. Um, so if this local historic district was like 2010s, 2016, does that mean um, that the retaining walls or the walls across the street um, that you showed us photos of and John pointed out, those were prior to the local historic district being established in the city? Yeah, as, as far as I can tell, um, there haven't been any retaining, front yard retaining walls installed. Um, you know, I'm, you're new, I'm, I'm pretty new. Uh, and so I, I've been here since February, so I don't have the case history quite well as some of the, and maybe somebody can find in if they know other uh, example. No, I, saw that, right. I saw that um, 1359, um, which is the one with the stone wall across the street, was renovated mm -hmm. in the late 90s. So maybe that could be a clue as to what. But I just wanted to get some clarification that that indeed occurred before the local historic district, which was under um, our jurisdiction. So. Yeah. And, and to be honest, that's a, that's something that um, we wrestled with a little bit and eventually decided to punt to you um, because the, the standards are very clear in terms of the historic pattern, uh, maintaining that, that grade uh, and, and discourage retaining walls in the front yard. Um, and so if you, if you're going to make that decision, we felt like it was outside of the staff purview to make that to make that call, and so that's why it's here now. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, so Kenton, I, I have a yes, question Mike. as well for, for Mr. Yes, Knight. please. Uh, it, it it feels like that uh, when the inspector was on site the first time, uh, the uh, the CMU backup wall was in place, but the stone facing was not in place and at that point in time that's when the city inspector said uh you're at your risk uh of, of completing this because this doesn't meet uh local or current requirements so at that point in time the stone had been put on the cinder block uh you know retaining wall had been in place uh at that is, is that correct well the 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 um, this, and I can bring up some photos if you, if you give me a few minutes, maybe we can hear from the app, and he might be able to clear that up too. Um, that there was there was some um, at least the foundation and rebar 
for the for the walls were in place on whenever it was the 18th of August. And then um, the work continued. Um, the the photos that you saw of construction underway, and there's a bobcat out in front. That's um, beginning of September, I think September well, 11th, I think. And then uh, the final photos were were later. The the actual stop work order was posted on August 22nd. All right, that might be a good segue into uh, asking the applicant to make his presentation to us. Is that Mr. Dick? Mr. Dick, uh, Mr. can't Dick hear you. Trying to do two things at once. Can you can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. I can hear you. Please proceed. I'll I'll pull up the presentation. Oh, excuse me. Um, can you see that? Okay. I I, I don't know that I have. Um, presentation mode, but I think we'll be able to see it okay. Yeah, I've got it on my screen. So first of all, uh, you know, thanks for the opportunity to speak a bit and, and um, you know, we're, we are, <clears throat> you know, certainly want to try to get through the chronology of, of, of the issue a little bit and, and some of the rationale behind it. And I'll um, kind of start with that chronology if I can. I'm going to. Oh, excuse me. So it, just a bit of a brief history on, on, on how we got into the neighborhood. So, um, you know, Joan and I, my wife, um, we were living at 1362 Princeton, so it's very close um, to the to the project area, and um, you know took the opportunity to to purchase the home in in April of 2018, and have been through a, a, a reasonably extensive process on kind of the you know, the renovation, uh, if you will, of the home, and um, you know have been through several um, a certificate of appro uh, of appropriateness amended certificate, second amended certificate, and then and and then a landscape uh, certificate for the for the backyard. And we got started in the this landscaping at about the 12th of August and uh, substantial construction was complete um, on both the home and the, the land, the front wall landscape about September 10th. And the, and and you know in the in the it was difficult at the time to kind of understand what was going on as there was no uh, real face-to-face -face meetings. And when, when I received, I received a letter um, that on, on August 27th, I believe, and, and gave it to the contractor at that time. So that was kind of the first formal notification that I had that, that, we, that we had an issue. And um, I provided that to the contractor. He said, well, we, we have submitted the information to uh, and the proper authority will get an answer in due time. You know, our it, it, as we um, got. I, I apologize. I'm a little bit just you know to give you some kind of background of, of, of who's involved in the project and 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 some of the consulting and contractors we've had. You can you can read the list, but. We've had um, you know good support from the team, and, and we chose them basically on their experience in the neighborhood, and and work that they had done, and understanding of the of the the rules, the codes, um, and um, you know, and I think we got good advice, and 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 essentially, you know, what Annie told us at the beginning of the project, and and as we began to make applications that. It, she said, you know, this is pretty simple, Joe. Um, 
don't make any changes that that alter the property street appearance and if you do have to make if we do have to make any modifications um, to maintain or preserve the structure make them match original and and if you can't if we can't make them match original then they have to be appropriate and all of that is judged by um, the appropriate authorities and 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 we were um, you know very accepting of that and you know kind of feel that um, in this situation due to communication errors um, we didn't get this in front of or we would agree that a, that a certificate of appropriate was necessary and we, we uh, regret the decision not to pursue it um, in advance but we we, we, we had some uh, conflicting information around it and um, but we we accept and understand that that was our responsibility um, I, I, <laughs> I, I'll just give you an aside. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you from Athens, Greece. It's about um, you know, quarter to four in the morning. So um, it's a bit, I've been up a while. Um, I, this, this diagram I think is kind of important. And, and as we began the project, what, what we found is if you, if you can see the number ones and the number twos on, and this is the original structure that there was about a seven inch grade drop that the, 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 the property had settled and there was some differential settlement. So between, you know, red dot number one and red dot number two, it's about seven inches that the property had come down. And, and, and it was pretty obvious that, you know, the, the, where the flow and, and where the hydraulic gradient existed on the property. And, 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 and when we were in construction where the blue line exists there, there we had to replace the sewer line out into the street. And, and there's, a, for lack of a better term, a cow's belly in the sidewalk. And, and, and you can see that the, that the water moving there was causing some settlement in, in the sidewalk. And I was a little bit concerned that it might cause other issues. And, and in that area, of course, we live, um, we live less than a block away. And, and, and when we would um, be visiting the project in the wintertime, there was an ice, ice buildup in that area. Um, so, you know, it was on our minds um, from early on in the project that, that something had to be done. And as we uh, kind of give you, give, you, give you kind of a sense of what that looked like. And if you recall from the original uh, picture that uh, Nelson had showed, the, the, the house was slightly different in the front, but that was, the, the problem was, is that was foundation issues there and um and settlement you can kind of see on the, on the picture on the side that that the door frame is in square but that's kind of the and and that dip angle is is the angle that the house is sloping so you know from from east to west and from um south to north and you know you can see you can see that what's termed as a wall there what it, what it, what it is really in practice is an elevated french drain is in the in in what we what we had done was uh, just a couple more photos this is the this is the west wall and you can see uh, exterior wall and you can see that, that it begins to kind of dip away from the squared structure as we kind of caught up and, and reinforced the the structure from the inside um so there there, there, there was you know s s some issues and we knew we had a, to deal with the problem there or you know, can't, I can't say that that we were sure that the uh, settlement was continuing, but we weren't sure that it wasn't. And so, you know, our, our view was number one: if we're going to get a hold of that problem, the first thing we got to do is get the water away from the foundation. So, in the, in, in the back of the house, which which we did put in a letter of appropriate or a certificate of appropriateness was granted. Um, there was an existing wood structure um, kind of retaining the, the slope and that had rotted out and, and so the water was moving kind of straight through the property. Well, we, we reconstructed that with drains so that we could move the water around the property and then we picked up all of the downspouts and piped them out into the front lawn. So we brought everything that we could to the front lawn and then our, our thinking was to, to um, move that downstream downstream rather than continuing it out into the uh, sidewalk where we had um, obvious settlement and and then potentially 
um, it, you know, it's running at courseway very close to where our sewer line installation was. And we didn't want to see us end up with um, additional potholes and other problems in the street, which is kind of evident from, you know, water that, that potentially might not manage the best way in the neighborhood at some time. So, so that was the solution. And when we, when we, when we bring everything around the house without attenuation of, you know, moving through the soils, um, we're getting a, a lot more water out front quickly, which which potentially we solved one problem, but maybe we exasperated another. And and the attempt when we got into landscaping was to solve that. And um, you know, I, 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 as a homeowner, you, you have a little bit of an issue around uh, liabilities and things that come with sidewalks and uh you know maintaining public safety so you know those kind of things were on our mind um you know I, I, if you kind of look back to the house and and um you know we we feel like we we did a lot of work to kind of improve the integrity of the structure for um going forward for time and 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 um think that we also did a, a, a pretty good job of, of managing the water between our neighbors to the east and the west. So we, we actually kind of did the same thing to keep the water coming in from the east neighbor. And then we made certain that we weren't passing any problem downstream. So so we also worked with our neighbor to the to the west to improve. And, and there was a bit of evidence of erosion and, and that kind of thing. So we'd work together to to solve it. Um, and so what what you know when we when we got to a potential solution that that wall retaining wall really isn't retaining anything it is it's basically uh, a front for a drain that moves the prop that moves um water coming around the house from east to west and and that that wall it would um you know the landscaping plan would anticipate um you know, some kind of a ground cover. So, you, so you would we tried to keep as much slope as we could, and um, we would put a vine or a green ground cover, so it would have a, a very similar type um, view uh, in, in the future as it had in the past, although not identical. You know, and and we kind of looked through the neighborhood as we were thinking of, of how to do this, and you know, if, if, assuming first of all that there's a need to do it, and and that the um the, the issue we're trying to solve is legitimate for issues of public safety and maintenance of the of the property um then did we do what did what we have done or chose was appropriate and, and we looked about the neighborhood and tried to get something that kind of fit the scheme of the neighborhood and old world stone was what we chose um and and as as mr knight mentioned uh, the specifications provided by the the contractor and landscaper um, have are in earlier submissions and 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 that's what the staff report is based on without really kind of a, a better understanding of the problem or the rationale for it. Um, it, it you know when you know assuming whatever happens here if, if we elevate the sidewalk um, back to kind of where it was originally it's about um, from one end about three inches in the center about six inches that it would come up and on the far end a, a couple inches where it has subsided and so a bit of the wall would disappear and and the uh, uh, vine cover or la or landscape cover would, it would essentially disappear um, you know these are these are pictures um, along um, Harvard Avenue between 1300 East and 1500 East and you know, there's lots of different, um, you know, applications. Some are stone, some are manufactured stone or brick, some are, are, are cement. So, um, you know, we thought we were we were um, kind of in the appropriate style or scape for the area. And and Mr. Knight also showed this picture, of, and this is our view out our front door, looking across the street, and uh, you know, the, the 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 house on the downslope side that. The, that elevated French drain on our side would end up with a, you know, a, a ground cover or something like that. So that, you know, attempting to blend into the slope, into the slope. And we did, we did some also some work and where we removed some vegetation to meet code on 
visibility in and out of the driveway and, and those kind of things that, um, you know, were incorporated into landscape design. So, you know, I, I guess to summarize, you know, a bit embarrassed about the fact that we, we have, you know, worked pretty closely in, in certificates of appropriateness over a, a long period of time and got a miscommunication um, on, on this one and somewhat, um, somewhat driven by COVID and inability to get face-to-face -face meetings and that kind of thing. And so, you know, we certainly, you know, respect the idea that uh, 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 of the commission, there were, um, you know, we've chose, we chose to live in the neighborhood. We, we know what the, uh, the requirements are. We, we've had good advice. Um, you know, and I, it, it, I, you know, from my point of view, I, I just want to point out that we're we're doing our best to kind of preserve this this structure and make sure that um, you know further deterioration doesn't occur. Um, the, the the work inside the home to kind of you, you can imagine with that kind of settlement what we might have went through on the inside of the home on lots of modifications um, or ways to um, level floors and, and do that kind of thing. So, uh, and, and we're committed to, you know, doing the right thing in the neighborhood. You know, Joan's daughters live just on the other side of the, of 1300. Um, we're, we're here for the long term, and, you know, certainly want to, you know, be um, considered a, a good neighbor to everyone in the, in, in the area. And, you know, we've, we've attempted to do that. So, um, you know, if there's any questions for me, I'll, I'll attempt to answer them. Um, if not, um, you know, that's kind of, that's how we ended up where we were and, and apologize for the miscommunications. Um, we do feel that there is an issue with um, how the water moves across the sidewalk and there is a potential future issue with, with how that might um, affect um, you know the, the the street along the sewer line that we had to replace. You know we met we met compaction standards and everything else, but you know water over time does significant things. And and, and in my career, I've dealt I've dealt with uh, many type of settlement issues. I'm not I'm not an expert, but the empirical knowledge from problems encountered in my work. I'm a mining engineer, and I work uh, work in locations um, around the world and have encountered uh, this kind of thing. And, you know, it always comes down to the water. So um, thank you for the opportunity to present and I and, you know, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Dick. That presentation is really helpful to uh, get a bigger picture of the, <clears throat> of the project. Maybe I'll start out with one question. If I understand right, the, your wall is intended to divert the water downhill, I guess, towards the west. What keeps yes. that water that you've diverted there from going onto the neighbor's property? Well, there's a it, it it so first of all, you know, along the west um, property boundary, we worked with a neighbor and improved the um, soil retention. So we put um, work with him to match the uh, things along the property line so it fit with his um, landscape, and then. We have a, a, a drain hose. We're trying to attempting on both sides of the property to hit the driveway spill away out rather than come under the sidewalk or through the sidewalk. So we're going out out the driveways on both on both sides. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have questions for Mr. Dick? And I can't see all of your little uh, thumbnails, so speak up if you have a question. Babs, I see your hand up. Did you have a question? No, I'm sorry, I just didn't hit the thing twice. <laughs> Problem. Oh. There we go, done. Okay, no questions for Mr. Dick. Very good. Uh, then we will open it up to public comment. Uh, do we have any any members of the public who wish to speak to this issue, Nick? We do. Um, I'm just going to go down the list in alphabetical order as they show up. First up, we have um, 
Amy Powell. Amy, you are unmuted. Thank you. So I just have a couple of comments. We are um, Joe and Joan's immediate West neighbors and wanted to comment that they have been incredibly respectful of the property in, uh, throughout the, re uh, the uh, preservation process. So the renovation process has been very respectful of the 1928 property that they own. The slope, um, if you are questioning the slope, you should actually come by the site. There is still a slope in spite of the 20 inch barrier that they have created. And the barrier is actually very much in uh, line with what else is included on our neighborhood, in our neighborhood. Uh, I don't think that this is anything that um, is different uh, or crazy in terms of a 1928 property. But I think the thing that we most appreciate is the water barrier uh, aspect of this. So uh, Neil and I renovated our house about three years ago and had major water issues like a bobcat sunk into our driveway in the process of renovating our home. And so what Joan and Joe have done is basically created this barrier that takes stuff out um, and uh, makes it so that it's not gonna come into our yard. And we really appreciate that. And I just want to respect what they've done. Good, thank you very much. Uh, next comment, please. Next up, we have Cindy Cromer. Hi, can you all hear me? We can. Yes, we can hear you, Cindy. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, I'm not gonna present um, a solution, unfortunately. I'm just gonna try to articulate, once again, the issue of historical landscapes as context. So um, the question is whether I will live long enough to see um, a recognition that landscapes are part of the historical context. I have now been working on this for something like 20 years. Um, I think from my perspective, there's a disconnect between the materials in the wall and the house. The materials in the wall may match the materials in other houses, but I don't feel that they're sympathetic to this house. So I'm really pleased to hear that the owners are planning to camouflage the wall if it's allowed to remain. Um, I, I just think the color values and the actual materials themselves are not in sync with the house. Um, it's unfortunate that the architect and the landscape designer um, weren't communicating because I believe that this architect has experience with historical landscapes on an issue in greater avenues. Was that time? No, or, you, no, you got another minute, Cindy. Um, Okay, and uh, I'm trying to be efficient. And I have seen um, National Register status denied because the historic um, landscape context was uh, gone from a historic building that I thought had tremendous merit. And so um, it, it, it can be rather shocking when you go through the process and then all of a sudden somebody identifies the, the, the landscape as a key element. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to the abrupt um, discovery of landscapes of historical context, and I really hope the city will be putting more emphasis on that in the future because um, they are character-defining elements, those landscapes. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Next uh, public comment, please. Is there, so we have two other attendees. Um, I know at least one of them looks like they're with the applicant, um, but I'm going to see, and I know one submitted some written comments, but I wanted to see if, if this person wanted to speak as, to, as well. Uh, Lynn Pershing, I'm gonna unmute you if you would like to, to speak. You're unmuted. Oh, okay. Um, I'm familiar with French drains and I've, uh, French drains are often put around foundations. Uh, French drains can also be put in the yard for increased drainage. And so I was, I, I was curious why the, the, the 20 inch wall, I think, I think uh, French drains could have installed in the yard without having to erect a wall. So I would like to, I would like to hear some, some uh, discussion on that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have the applicant respond to that when we're done with public comments. 
Uh, and was there one more, Nick? Yeah, I'm just going to check to make sure this person is that I was right. Um, this is uh, Dean Anessi, I think. Dean? Yes, I'm here. Uh, are you you with the applicant, or did or did you want to make a comment? Well, um, or both. <laughs> I, I'm not in my office right now, but I'm. Uh, I heard the comments about the um, the stone not matching. It was a compliment, but um, also behind that wall there is a French drain. There is some drainage uh, capabilities there as well. I have nothing to really add. All right, great, thank you. Uh, I would also, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll also add that in the Dropbox there are a number of email comments that that we have received. So hopefully you've had an opportunity to see those. Uh, I think there's eight or nine. Commissioners, in there. Commissioners, I'd ask you to take a quick look at those if you are able. Um, Mr. Oh, Dick, would you like to? Oh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Oh, pardon me, this is Michaela. I forwarded the commission an email that came in after five o'clock. Um, for some reason, it wasn't able to be put in your Dropbox. And I wrote the applicant back and said, I would just read it off in the record to make sure that you all got it is Daniel Wolf. And she just said, I'm writing in support of the beautiful wall erected at 1365 Harvard Avenue. As a neighbor, I'm layered. I've watched this beautiful restoration of this regal home on Harvard from the beginning and believe that it fits the neighborhood perfectly. Thank you. Okay, very good. All right, um, Mr. Dick, would you like to uh, any more comments, respond to that uh, question from the public? The, the the issue so so in the drainage we we brought that out fairly far out um into the slope so we it, 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 a french drain that would be below the lawn um where we brought the drainage out would be subgrade to the there's no way to ex, there was no way to exit it as we uh in the design you know, that potentially could have been done differently um but as we as we brought that out we wanted to get it as far from the house as possible and so it was an elevation question more than than anything else so um we didn't we didn't have a way to exit the water above grade all right thank you um commissioner's last Opportunity to ask Mr. Dick any questions before we go into executive session. Aiden, please proceed. Um, yes, Mr. Dick, I am curious, were there any other options explored besides the wall? Well, that the, you know, the, the subgrade French drain was um, the other alternative. <laughs> We, we could not come up with a way to exit it um, above sidewalk grade. Um, and you know, our, our concern is it, 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 as we brought um, that water forward without the attenuation of moving through the soil that we were gonna get more water in a, in a you know, pulsing kind of method that there, or way in storms, because we were bring, bringing it forward quickly, you know, so the the backyard is is basically all hardscape and stone. So we're bringing all of that forward. Um, and so my concern was that we were potentially going to make the situation that we had out front worse. You know, and I, you know, I, I, you got to think about public safety and, and, and the roadways. So that's that was it. The, the, the other option was was below grade. Um, and if we pulled it back closer um, um, to the house, um, that was the other concern. So if we topped it at the crest before the slope, that we potentially, um, you know, could have a backward motion towards the towards the foundation. Those were the alternatives, above grade or below grade. Thank you. Mr. any other questions for the applicant? Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dick. Uh, we will now close the public 
portion of this discussion, this item, and move into executive session. Who would like to uh, begin our discussion? Hi, Will. Please. Okay, cut or lose. Well, if it was a offense to the period, I think it would have had cock-ups. You know, uh, a cock-up is a sharp uh, stone placed like this all along the fence so that the bull would get caught in his bits and not go to the next field. That is that era and that area in uh, England and Ireland and all those places. So that made me laugh that there was no cock up there. Um, there it, it, this is really hard because I agree with the staff and I agree with his drainage there as well. And that across the street are all of these fences. So I'm, I'm, I'm really torn. It's like Trump 50, Biden 50. I don't know what to do. <laughs> hmm. you know, okay, David. I want to quickly weigh in that um, this is a historic landmark commission. We're not a parking commission or a drainage commission. And that uh, we're here to review uh, historical aspects. And, I, and perhaps we need to keep that in mind. Good point, David. I have a, excuse me, Kent and I had a, yes. had a comment. In, in reading the report, the, the two things that stood out uh, were, you know, that the landscaping was a defining feature and that, uh, that you know, the, the, the sloping landscape was a, a visual continuity that was wanted from the very beginning. And so, just like John, I, I drove the site, uh, you know, and drove the neighborhood and and if this were the only wall uh retaining wall or whatever if, if this were the only retaining wall then then i would say you know this is in in strict violation i think it is in violation but when i look at at, at across the street and you know up and down the street just a little bit east and west there's other walls now over the course of time you know the wall across the street i believe it is you know, it's got vines covering uh, the retaining wall, so that that softens that hard edge just a bit. Um, you know, living in in historic homes, I'm, I'm I'm all understanding of the you know the five, six, seven, eight inch settlement, and I understand what was done. So just as as Bev was saying, you know, I, I understand the 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 report, and and I understand what the what the neighbors have done. Uh, or excuse me, what the, what the applicant has done. And so, um, you know, if we're looking at this through historic eyes, uh, if this is this is a violation. This is different than what was, you know, it, 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 it's, it's in violation of the defining feature and the visual continuity. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm, that's, that's where I am right now. You know, I, I do believe that that there's some good to this. Uh, I wish at at the time that that the first order uh, was noted that 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 a an alternate design that may have been halfway between uh, what was done. And I fully understand that the print strain is right behind the wall, and and it empties at the driveway. That that makes sense. I get it. And so. If it was any lower than that, then there's no place for it to, to drain to. So I, I'm just, I, I'm torn. Let's, let's just put it that way. <clears throat> okay, Mike, that, thanks for that. Uh, Robert, we haven't heard from you in a bit. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I hate these kind of cases. You know, I've been a real estate attorney for 40 years and I know you know, and I've dealt with city code violations and, and uh, created some in the avenues of my own. It's always tough because, you know, maybe we wouldn't have approved this if it come to us before, just because I like the continuity. On the other hand, as Mike points out, it's in these areas this old, it's never perfectly complied with anyway. And the kind of effort and quality expense that went into this, you hate to 
It's almost like you you you, you hate to not approve it. You, you don't like it when people go do things without permits because then, you know, how do we how do we uh, precedent's not good that people think well I'll get away with it if I don't get a permit. But I don't think there was any intent here to, to do that, and and I would probably approve it uh, even though staff recommends we don't. I I just don't think uh, the uh, remedy of taking it out justifies, you know, as commensurate with the city. Uh, but, I, but I just, it's a balancing act and it's, uh, there's a good case on both sides. But in the end, when we're done, I'd probably, I'd probably approve it. Thanks, Robert. Victoria, your thoughts, please. Well, my question for cases like this is always, did you know that you bought a historical property? And he admitted that he did. And he admitted that he made a mistake. And so it takes all the wind out of my sails. And like Robert said, <laughs> it feels like a very strange balancing act because it's not out of character for the neighborhood, but it is apparently out of character for the historicity that they're going for in preservation. So I, I am also feeling really torn on this. Thank you. John, it's your pitch. Yeah, I wanna start by commending the applicant on the overall preservation of this house. It's a beautiful house in a, in a beautiful neighborhood and I think they did an amazing job. Um, that, that said, the landscape is a character defining feature of the property and, and um, you know, hearing Nelson talk about how this was really written into some of the covenants and um, deed restrictions and stuff on on the original subdivision to me um, really hammers that home. Um, and I think um, you know, Aid. I think Aiden made the best point when she asked. You know, we're, we're talking about these other retaining walls in the neighborhood, but um, those were all approved, you know, they didn't require approval because they were built before this was a local historic district. So that's before that was even in our jurisdiction. So to, to me, now is the time to start, um, you know, discouraging these kind of retaining walls, even if they've been built um, over the last couple of decades, like, if, if this became a local historic district in the last five years, and this is the first retaining wall to be built, um, we should probably nip that in the bud now, rather than having a bunch of these kind of cases coming up um, in the future. So that's kind of my take. I think, um, yeah, obviously, like procedurally, if it had been done um, more by the book, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, I think we would have flagged it and and tried to come up with a different solution earlier. And I definitely think there are different solutions to the drainage issue. So, thanks, John. Aiden, would you like to comment, please? Yes. Um... Like most commissioners have stated, it is kind of hard. Um, the applicant, I don't think, had necessarily had ill intent, and I do appreciate um, what he's done for the property and willingness to comply in the past and taking the time to state um, the, his case. But even though I personally, um, enjoy the look of the wall and appreciate the time that was taken to choose materials, um, et cetera. Uh, it's just difficult to look at the standards for historic preservation, um, especially within the city and see just how many um, standards it doesn't comply with and to go ahead and approve something um, that doesn't comply within the local historic district, I would have a hard time with um, personally. I think I agree with John, just being able to nip something like this now so that people don't continue um, to do 
something like this that directly violates um, these standards. Good, thank you. I'll throw in my two cents here. So I, I slowly rode my bike down the down Harvard this morning looking around and I had not yet thoroughly read the staff report and I rode down, saw the other houses, saw the wall in question, saw the other walls around there and I my thought then was, what's the big deal? It, it fits in, uh, it, it is subtle, um, so the house is really well restored uh, and then moved on and came down to work and read, uh, read through the staff report, heard Nelson's, uh, Nelson's report and clearly the, the wall is contradicting the, the letter of the law, if you will. Um, but uh, hearing, hearing the applicant's story, looking at how diligently they work through the historic process and getting their COAs multiple times for other things, uh, you know, they clearly didn't, they clearly intended to try to comply by the rules in, in all the cases that they, they knew of. And this this fell between the cracks. Um, I was going to ask bef before I prompted heard all your comments. You know, would we be looking at this differently if it hadn't been built yet, and this wall was proposed? And clearly, a couple of you have have said that uh, they wouldn't have gone for this solution, and that's I think that's valid, but. For me, it's not a slam dunk that this doesn't look right and should be pulled. I guess my, it, it, if it was the only retaining wall in the neighborhood uh, and would stick out like a sore thumb and be uh, an obvious element that someone else would say, oh, look, at that's the only one here. Maybe I can sneak by and do my own. Uh, that would raise a red flag for me. but. I don't see it being that different from what's there. So the uh, the importance of using this as an example and starting to nip it in the bud holds less weight as as I consider this uh, this application. So, and, and Kenton, uh, I would ask I would ask you to your architect. I don't know what that noise is. Um, as an architect, um, the talk about the French drains and it made complete logical sense to me because that is just so crucial, particularly with older homes, I must say, um, to preserve them. So did that ring true for you, what he was talking about and how he placed them? Yes, it did with an asterisk after that, yes. Because as David pointed out, the, uh, we are not uh, a civil engineering review board. So we can't really make a decision based on that. But yeah, it all made sense. You know, I, you, I've been down that street in the rain and it, it's an issue. And also talking architecturally, uh, I, I would agree with someone, might have been uh, Cindy Cromer, who said the wall didn't look quite right uh, with that building. And, uh, you know, I. I like the idea of the vine if the wall is to stay. I agree. Thank you. Commissioners, more discussion? Mm -hmm. Or is someone uh, prepared to make a motion on this? I'm going to make an observation first. And um, I love to say that doctors bury their mistakes and architects are <laughs> on theirs. <laughs> Um, but, you know, as, as I look at this, I don't see a clear path to um, to approving the applicant's request. I, I can I can see perhaps a way around um, uh, standard eight and nine, but I'm having a really tough time with two and five and the commissioner can um, find a way around all four. Hey, David, two, two things. One, we have a hard time hearing you. Okay. But second, to 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 make your point, would you read those 
read those standards to us, please, as you. Uh, okay, so um, they're in a report, but I say, could say the first two standards, I don't see an easy way around. And it's uh, standard two is the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. And I'm having a tough time with that one. Um, number five. Uh, distinctive. Can you guys hear me better now? Number five, distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques are examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved. Now, the next two, I think there, there may be there's some workarounds. Um, eight, contemporary designs for alterations and additions to existing properties shall not be discouraged, blah, blah, blah. And nine is uh, additions or alterations to structures and objects should be done in such a manner that if those additions or alterations were to be removed, the essential form integrity remains. So, and, you know, those, I think that's, um, you know, we could probably find a way around those. But I, I just had to have a tough time with two, with, uh, the two and five. Thank you, David. Commissioners, what, what do you think of uh, what's, what David referred to there or, or where we might be? Aiden, you're looking thoughtful. <laughs> well, and I say that because we have to specifically, in a, in a motion, specifically give reasons um, that we, uh, for approval, um, with those uh, uh, yeah, with those four standards in mind. Mm -hmm. am, am I reading something in this, David? Are you thinking there might be some workaround or some way that we can address this? You know, I don't know, but um, ultimately things, you know, if we don't approve it, it, it will get appealed. And, um, um, you know, perhaps we open an avenue there. I don't know. True. What what David is referring to is there is an appeal process if we deny the application. Uh, so it's it's very possible that if denied, this application could go to appeal and be approved with uh, and remain just as it is. Let me let me clarify that uh, if the matter were appealed and the hearing officer um, granted the appeal, that's not necessarily going to approve it. Uh, it may just send it back to the Landmark Commission. Uh, thank you, Paul. <coughs> For new commissioners, Paul, Paul Nielsen is our uh, city attorney who keeps us out of trouble on, uh, on all matters. <laughs> well, all matters relating to this city business. Okay, um, unless there are more comments, uh, Aiden. Um, my thoughtful look was I just wanted to maybe read, um, before we make our decision, read one of the um, standards that David's having a hard time with. Just I'm not sure if all the commissioners were able to read through the analysis um, of all of these standards. So. Is it okay if I just read a section from standard two um, just to reiterate kind of what we're looking at? Yeah, um, please. So in the staff report, the um, analysis of standard two, which the states the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features in spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided, which was the first one that David read. Um, so the objectives from a preservation handbook for historic residential properties in districts in Salt Lake City, um, there are a few listed in the analysis is, in addition to the historic structures, the Harvard Heights Historic District is enhanced by visual components that are important in the cohesive streetscapes, including tree-lined sidewalks, uniform setbacks, and a substantial variation in topography. Um, typography, sorry. Yards incline uniformly from front porch to sidewalk. 
along the south side of Harvard Avenue, reflecting the original design of the subdivision in which the Harvard Heights Historic District is contained. The historic grading provides a unifying visual cohesiveness to the streetscape and is character defining. This historic grading pattern is an important characteristic of the Harvard Heights Historic District that should be retained. So I just wanted to reiterate that to you all just as a comment in the decision making process, because um, although, as we've been told by a public call, there is still a gradient. This is listing a substantial gradient from the house to the sidewalk as character defining. Um, so that's just something I wanted uh, to keep in mind. Good, thank you, Aiden. Not much ambiguity in, in that uh, item. All right. Hampton. Victoria. Would you mind, in the Q&A, there is a woman named Amy Powell who is asking for a response. Would you just, as a point of procedure, just clarify that public comment is over and we're in executive session? I just don't want her oh, to be yes. ignored. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. <clears throat> uh, we are in executive session now. The public comment period has ended. And uh, un uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, allow you to speak, any members of the public to speak at this time. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out, Victoria. I did not see that. So, so Kenton, can I can I make a comment? Yes, sir. Um, this stuff's fairly subjective, as we all know, and we we've dealt we don't deal with landscaping very often, right? And I'm not saying it's not part of it, but I don't know that it's the same. I mean, these houses have been there for 80 years, 70, 80 years, and and it doesn't. Uh, um, Landscapes get changed in all these houses, and I, I agree. There's, I understand the gradient and the the look that's there, but I would argue that's largely still there. I mean, you still have the same setbacks. You still have the yard still slopes. It doesn't slope as much because they put a small wall at the front. But you know, the one right across the street has a wall significantly higher, and uh, um, much more offensive to it. And, and I guess when there's exceptions, there's exceptions, and. You know, I guess I would argue it's not doesn't violate the overall spirit of preserving the landscaping um, to to uh, to have a small wall there. It still slopes down. It still has a lot of the features. So um, anyway, I just think I, it's you know it's a matter of degree, and I just don't know that uh, that you know. And I know we don't get a we don't get into cost, but it's uh, a crazy amount of cost to redo this and and. Uh, that's not that you know that can be a driving factor, but it's still a factor out there when you look at what everyone's done to all these houses over the last 80 years. Uh, the general character is still there. Um, do we ever just to ask Kenton? Is there a protocol to say we like it, but based on what you were telling us, you need to cover that in greenery? Can we put that kind of stipulation on something? Um, perpetuity or, um, so, what well, say that again, please, David. So, that, then if we say that they, you know, a certain landscape element has to be incorporated, then we're suggesting they also have to water it. And then, uh, then is the city responsible for covering the water bill or whatever? I mean, that, how does that work? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of hard to do that. This is Michaela hopping in kind of to David's point too, because landscaping can die and then you still have, you know, the wall or the window or whatever we're trying to, to screen. Yeah, I think it would be difficult, but I, I listening to what Robert said, I, I tend to agree that we, if the applicant had wanted to come in and plant uh, a hedgerow mm -hmm. along there, like they did across the street, uh, and completely block the view of the slope, we couldn't say anything about that. Um, the trees 
They could have planted trees. There could be, uh, there's nothing in the ordinance that would keep them from pulling out the turf grass and planting cacti in a rock bed on their private property. Uh, you know, I don't, again, my, my personal experience riding down the street this morning was that this wall did not detract from the appreciation of the historic building at all. Uh, you know, I, I, I almost wonder if we weaken our standing in the community, if we make someone pull out what to a lot of people seems like a perfectly appropriate approach to dealing with a landscape issue. You know, it's, I think in answer to my own question from earlier, would we be looking at this differently if we were seeing it at the right time before it was built? Yeah, maybe, but we aren't there. Yes, sir. Can Please I go, Mike. That I think that, and I know I'm an architect and it's hard not to design something, but I think that there is a middle ground and I think that there is a way to modify the landscape, to to accommodate the the wall that's there, and and to you know to Robert's point, and and to David's point, this is not an inexpensive wall, but there's a way to to add landscape that I think would visually lessen the impact of the wall. I, I would assume that the the French drain is something on the order of of maybe eight to ten inches, so that's half the height of the wall. It leaves another 10 inches or so above the wall that that something can be planted that that as in the street or as in the home across the street, you know, where where the greenery can can, you know, dive over the wall and, and you know, at a glance, it, it's green from the sidewalk to the house. You know, it still satisfies the, the drainage issues that that I know the, the owner has has tried to, to address. So my, my feeling is, is I think there's a middle ground that, that, that you know, I, I think we all acknowledge that the hard letter of the law says, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a defining feature and, and there's visual continuity and this disrupts that. So is there a middle ground that, that, that tries to get back to the defining feature and visual continuity as much as possible without, quote, throwing the wall away? That that's what I would think that there would be a middle ground that that could satisfy both both aspects. Okay, interesting thought, Mike. Um, with that in mind, would we want to? Uh, I forget what do we call it if we don't give them a no and don't give them a yes. Ask them to come back with uh, another idea. Okay. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was looking at, Kenton. That that if if we were the motion to deny carefully, so that and I'm and I'm looking at it and reading it right now, you know, further move that the commission direct the planning staff to work with the petitioner to find a front yard landscape design that will meet the standards, uh, and you know, and delegate administrative approval to staff. Although we would be quote, you know, it's a motion to to deny, I think there is a middle ground solution that would not, not dictate that the wall be removed. I think we've got to come at it the other way. We'd have to approve with conditions like that. Uh, Michaela, okay. is that? Yeah, I think so. I think we'd have to approve uh, with conditions, but I mean, listening to the conversation tonight, I mean, yes, this is an enforcement case and I don't want the commission to feel like you know, planning comes in with, we come in with our most technical analysis and it's, it's up to the commission to either go with what the staff reports or, or find that middle ground and go ahead and approve it. I, this one is a hard one because this isn't a six foot wall that was built. Um, mm -hmm. It is a new wall on that particular side of the street. Um, and I don't want you all to feel like well, I'd, I'd like to add too that from the history of the building renovation, uh, the applicant 
made every effort to do this by the book. So I, 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 I would encourage us to try to figure out a way to make this work, but, but soften, soften the edges, if you will. I Mike, think, do you want to try to? Mr. Chair? Mr. Yes, ma'am. I think I was muted. Did you hear what I had said previously when you asked me the question? At the very end, you cut yourself off. I'm sorry. You heard most of it. Do you want to try it again, Michaela? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. No, we I, heard, I, think we, we, I, I think I was, was finishing the thought was, although this is an enforcement case, I, you know, I want the commission to treat it as though it was coming in as a COA and something new. We certainly, we don't want, it's either appropriate or it's not. I don't want the commission or the public to feel like it's an enforcement case. We hold you to every single standard perfectly and like a higher standard. I want you all to use your discretion. If you feel like there's a middle ground, if you feel like it's okay, I think approving it and, and, and asking staff to come up with something, a, mm -hmm. a different treatment, I'm not sure that we can, quite frankly. I like, I like, I like the idea of what Mike said, and and I I think I'd I'd rather see us approve it with conditions, and the conditions can be what Mike was outlining, uh, rather than denying it with let them come back gets us to the same place, but maybe it's easier for everybody if we go the approval route. Right. Well, does someone want to take a stab at uh, motion? I'd like to see. I'd like to see the question. Then, can we would we would be asking the applicant to to we would approve, and we would be asking the applicant to 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 come back with the design, or that we would say, you know, it would be it would be approved on the condition that that uh, the the landscaping be modified to uh, to as much as possible. Uh, uh, remain, you know, or, or continue the visual continuity of, of the of the grass to the to the sidewalk, cover the uh, the base of the wall, something to that effect. So that that we're what we're really saying is we're going to approve this, but you need to do something different. You need to to modify the design, and and we and then they would come back and we would review that design, or we would say, and, and Michaela, where I was going was was saying. You know, this is we're going to prove it, but you need to make some changes. Go ahead and work with with the uh, commission planning staff to do that. But what you're saying is you're really not prepared. The the commission planning staff's really not prepared to do that. I, I I'm saying if, if you'd like them to table it, we'd like some pretty clear direction from you all on on uh, how we work with them to do that. Uh, Richard, here. If, if that's the direction it goes, I um, I guess my heart is with design objective 1.1 and 1.6. I, I can see workarounds for 1.11, 1 1.13, and uh, yeah, and one and 1.10. Um, but I'm just I'm just having a tough time with objective 1.1, which is historically significant features shall be preserved and 1.6 the historic grading patterns and design of the site should be preserved um but you, you know we are talking about a 20 inch wall so i mean it, to earlier points that have been made it's um we're within spitting distance here of um of something that completely complies so so dave dave let me let me ask you on that you're the architect i'm I'm just a dirt lawyer, but but what the when you talk about historically significant site features should be preserved. I mean, landscaping on 80 year old houses. I mean, how 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 much can you mimic how they were landscaped 80 years ago? I mean, um, I guess I guess that the shore wall doesn't strike me as really altering it that drastically to to, to fail that condition. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to argue with that. Um, you could take it either way, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So back to 
attempting to reach a middle ground uh, in Michaela's concern, uh, I, I guess we'd have to have a pretty clear definition of what we were trying to achieve if we are to well, table it and ask them to come back with something else uh, versus approving and delegating it to to staff to figure out the details. I think we probably need to handle this ourselves with an, give, given the uh, back and forth discussion here. Um, so M M Michaela and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but we can table this, direct the applicant to do some specific things, and then they can come back to us at another meeting with a updated proposal. Would that work? I think that will work. I think that would work. I like I like that route, Kenton. Yep. Okay. I, I think because so it's there's... contentious it, because it's contentious already, Mr. Chair. If we approved it at a staff level, it could just be appealed and then bounced back to the landmark commission anyway. So I think that that's a clear path. Uh, which is the clearer path? The table. Be, be, because, because it's contentious in the neighborhood and it's an enforcement case and there are a number of folks in the neighborhood that have strong feelings about it, I'd prefer it would be tabled and with some directions so staff can work with the applicant and the applicant come can come back rather than approving it and just delegating all this, the final details to staff because if other folks in the neighborhood aren't happy with staff's final details, it's just going to be appealed and sent back to you regardless. Got it, got it. Okay, so process so, would so be- Michaela, if, if we were, so Michaela, if we were to say to, to table this, and direct the, the owner to work with staff to mitigate the, the visual impact of the 20 inch wall as much as possible. That would be the directive to, to this particular owner. Yes. Okay. Can we also add that, uh, I'm just wondering if they could look at other options other than a French drain. I mean, the French drain isn't the only way to mitigate groundwater moving through a site. There, there are other, other ways to do that. Well, I, I, I take a stab at this. I, I, um, I'll move that we table and uh, ask that the applicant specifically um, revisit design objectives 1.1 and 1.6. Okay, is that, is that, is that a motion then, David? Yes. I would second that motion, Kenton. Okay. Uh, was that, uh, Paul, was that motion stated in an official enough motion speak to uh, go forward? Sure. Motions to table uh, don't typically require um, technical specific findings other than giving a reason for tabling. Very good. Okay, then. Thank you, David, for your motion and Mike for your second. Um, we'll now take a vote on this motion. I will go down the list again. I will go up the list this time. So, uh, Mike. Aye. Can I have your vote? David? Aye, yes. Victoria? Yes. Aiden? Yes. Robert? Uh, yes. John? Yes. yes. And Babs? Yes. Very good. That motion to table passes unanimously. Uh, it's now in the hands of the applicant and staff, and we look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, before we, before we go, um, yes. I would just ask if, Thank the applicant for um, for uh, staying up 
pretty late or early. <laughs> yes. And, and yes. sharing with us. Very good, Nelson. That is, uh, we're all all appreciative of that. Um, yeah, thank you for all your effort and putting the your your presentation together too. That helped helped your case quite a bit. And uh, sleep for a few hours and then get a good cup of Greek coffee and <laughs> hey, I, I, see you uh, see you in a month. I very much appreciate uh, the consideration, everyone, and 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 certainly we'll do our best to come up with uh, to, to to meet the objectives. And um, I, we love the neighborhood. And we'll do the right thing. Good. Thank you. And and do you have any questions about where we're trying to go with I, this? I think if we do, we'll come. Yeah, I, I think I pretty well understand, and and we'll come back with you know some ways of doing that and and you know and i would as, as expect all i need to know is who we communicate with at staff and i assume that's um michaela or, or, or mr knight and, and go, through, no, go through mr knight yep. you know, he, he's the man okay sounds great thank you thank you good night enjoy your evening and i'll enjoy my morning <laughs> Talk to Thanks you later. A lot. okay all right Thank you. Good, good discussion on that one. That's that's a tough one. I agree with um, with Robert when he said it. Don't really like these kind of enforcement issues. Okay. Really Next up for us as commissioners. Yeah. Uh, Next up is special exception uh, text changes in the Salt Lake City Code, and Nick will present this to us. Nick, oh. all yours. Thank you. Um, this is going to take me just a second to make sure that um, I'm on the right screen and to go back and forth since I'm also have the host duties right now. Um, Nick, I can yeah, take so this, host duties if you want. If um, I don't know if I can switch it. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, okay, <stop>. go ahead. <laughs> now that I'm in the in the presentation mode, so I'll I'll go through this presentation fairly quick and then exit out because there's no real need to keep the presentation open after that. But um, this is a proposal that we have uh, requested from the planning division to remove the special exception process from our code. Uh, it's a pretty sizable change. There's 42 <laughs> different special exceptions um, authorized in our zoning ordinance. Um, the key takeaways for the landmarks commission is that the only thing that's that's changing really for for you is that instead of somebody having to submit a special exception application and one of the applications required for the h overlay uh, now they only would have to submit the h overlay application the landmarks commission retains all of its authority that it currently has um, and to review anything within the within the um, overlay whether it's a historic district or a landmark site. Um, so those are all maintained. Uh, just real quick, some some background information. I've already went over some of this. We average about a right around 156 applications per year. There are, these are approved by both staff planning commission and the landmarks commission. And what a special exception is, is a minor, a small little change to a dimensional requirement or to an incidental use of the property. Um, things like fence heights and, and uh, building heights and setbacks for some things and additions to properties that don't meet setbacks and all of these other types of things, how accessory buildings are used, where mechanical equipment goes, all these kinds of things right now are listed um, as special exceptions when they're outside of a, a certain parameter. Uh, citywide, um, about 85% of these are all e are east of I-15. The two busiest districts um, are Districts 3 and Districts 5. District 3 makes sense because of the, um, the avenues in Capitol Hill and when those were developed and the unique nature of all of the, the sloping hillsides and the, the, the small lots and different lot sizes and shapes and all of those kinds of things. Uh, District 5 is actually a little bit of a surprise somewhat um, as to why so many are coming from from that district. 
Uh, but it's there is there are some why Westmoreland historic district and things like that. Just a few little things. Uh, we're not quite sure why that is, um, but it 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 is what it is. So um, we average about twenty hours per application. When they go to the commission, that jumps up to um, between forty and sixty hours. Uh, that's how much time it spends to produce staff reports and do the research and um, help the community understand what's going on and answer questions and gather all the public input and get all of the various um, comments back that we need. And the, one of the big reasons why we're doing this is that we are processing so many more land use applications now as a city than we than we have in the past. Uh, our workloads haven't been able to keep up. And so, as the city changes, we feel like some of our processes need to change as well, um, so that we can focus on the growth related issues that the city's facing instead of focusing on things like special exceptions, which really put all put a significant portion of our attention on individual properties instead of looking at, at bigger picture types of issues and, and impacts that the city needs. Um, special exceptions for a typical one covers about 40% of the cost for us to process. Um, so the, the fee is, is considerably low. And what that means is that our general fund is subsidizing these requests for property owners to uh, seek some sort of additional property right that they don't otherwise have um, under the, under the, if they were to follow the, the base zoning. Why, 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 why is that? Why? That's a that's a good question. I don't know. We are in the process of evaluating all of our application fees right now so that um, there's less subsidy going on. There are some things that we probably it's appropriate to subsidize. For example, uh, in historic districts, we want property owners to do the right thing and get the right permits. Um, and if fees are are if they're if we're charging the fee is covering the full cost to the city of applying that the likelihood of people doing work outside without the right approvals increases and so um but we don't know exactly why this the fee schedule that the city has established um but M michaela's been dedicating a lot of time to um analyzing how much time it's taking us what our fees are and what the appropriate uh fee should be okay Babs, you may have a better feeling for this but it it seems to me that um, the Salt Lake City fees for these sort of things are quite low compared to the- They are, they're insanely, Park City insanely low. And I, I think so, um, we often uh, look to Portland as one of our um, comparable cities, and I think there's a much more um, appropriate up there, if I remember, but this has been a bit, so. Well, not to get too off, off topic, but I can tell you that, and this is outside the Landmarks Commission, but in Salt Lake City, our plan development fee is nine hundred ish dollars, and it's nineteen thousand in Portland. So, for <laughs> for the essentially the same process. Uh, so, so I getting back, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> getting back to uh, to this and why we're proposing this um, this change. We've already talked about the staff resource and the geographic application of city resources. But the, this also accomplishes a, no, a number of other things. One, it simplifies our code. Uh, we have so many exceptions that it's oftentimes very difficult for us to explain to an applicant everything that needs to happen and what their options are and things like that. Um, it, it also is very challenging for us when people complain or call in to ask questions about what's going on next door um, or in the neighborhood. And we, we can't give yes or no answers. We always, you know, we have to say, well, normally it's this, but they might be able to get an exception to do this. Um, and so, so that makes it hard. It also creates situations where neighbors don't know what to expect next door. And this creates one of the infamous things that we have in this city, the neighbor versus neighbor. Uh, we, we heard a lot of, you know, pitting neighbors against one another. Um, because we're basically asking the neighbor to help us identify anything that may be wrong with what someone's proposing next door. Um, we've, we, we do feel like having a straightforward zoning um, regulation is way more appropriate for those situations so that people do know what to expect. Um, 
and it aligns our regulations with current trends. For example, uh, over the last nine months, we've all known and seen that how people and where people work is changing. And um, in Salt Lake City, you actually have to get special exception to use an accessory building for an office. Um, we know it's happening. Uh, we know that people aren't getting the right kinds of approvals, but we also understand that there's really no public um, benefit for having someone go through a process for something like that. Um, it should just be just be a standard property, right? And that's what we're proposing. So key changes, we've already talked about the historic district bulk modifications, and many of you are very familiar with this. Um, this still would be allowed through our existing processes. Um, an example of a bill in addition that, that this landmarks commission approved um, in the in the avenues um, extra height and some uh, different setbacks, I believe on this one. Um, grade changes in retaining walls right now. Um, the anything over four feet requires a special exception, but there's no cap on how tall any exception could be. And so um, the picture shows the right way to do this. These are mostly occurring in our foothills, um, but we have had some that are 20 plus feet in height and um, they're always uh, confrontational and, and controversial. And so one of the things that we have found pretty consistently with our planning commission is that they will put some and staff sometimes will, will put some required those retaining walls to be tiered. And that's what, what this does as well. Um, building heights in residential districts right now, you guys have that authority, but the special exception also grants that authority outside of, um, historic districts. Um, we want to maintain it in the historic districts because we do believe that it is a benefit that property owners get for being, um, within a historic district that they, they have some, um, um different bonuses that they have, they have the ability to apply for um, that other properties don't. Uh, this is also one that happens quite a bit up on the foothills like this picture shown. Um, right now, what would remain is the ability to match existing height or to match the height based on the development pattern of the block. So those things would remain, but the special exception to exceed or, or, or when those things aren't in place would go away. What, wait, wait, um, what is that picture there? So is that an example of the bad height? I, I wasn't getting that. Yeah, this is one that, that went through a special exception that's taller than everything else on the block face. And where is it? Um, this is up uh, near the in the upper Federal Heights near the university. I cannot remember the name of that that street, but um, okay. thank you. It's, it's one that that provides access to the university. Uh, accessory structure height. Um, we're not really changing anything by right, um, with the exception of we are we are allowing and and. I guess I shouldn't say we aren't changing anything by right because we are. And the, this bit, this slide was before we briefed the planning commission on this, and they gave us some guidance. But um, they they wanted to allow some additional accessory structure height up to a certain um, point, and so we are allowing it to go. Right now, most accessory buildings have to be 17 feet in height. There's some smaller ones in like the SR lower heights in the SR 1A district. This proposal would allow it to be. Um, taller than what's allowed in the underlying zoning district up to 75% of the principal building height. But up, it also in, requires an increased um, setback of, on a one foot per one foot increase in height basis. The planning commission also recommended that we put a, um, that we look at putting a cap on that up to 75%. So that, that increase ultimately ended up being uh, about a 25% total increase. So, for example, if you're in the R15000 zoning district, your your garage could be 17 feet in height. Um, this exception would allow garages up to 21 feet in height if the setback increases four feet, and the um, accessory building is no taller than 75% of the height of the principal building. Are you seeing this as an impact? Um from the ADUs that are coming so fast and furious? No, because the ADUs have their own height standards. 
And and so that's already being addressed in that, and we're not changing anything to do with ADUs in this in this code. But what we are seeing is an increase in people using um, their yeah. accessory structures for other uses, and and so particularly garages. Um, a lot of it, frankly, is storage because people are moving out of rooms, moving their storage out of rooms in their homes into their garage and they want to be able to have that that additional space or they're building a new garage to help accommodate that. So we're expanding it. Interesting. Um, so Nick, again, Nick, quick, quick question. What would happen, say you've got an existing garage that's close to the property line in an old neighborhood and you want to pop the top up to give yourself some space, but your setbacks aren't complying. You wouldn't be able to do that. You would be limited to the 17 feet in height of the underlying zoning okay. district because you couldn't meet that additional setback. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we already talked about this about using accessory buildings for other other types of things um, that are pretty common um, within, particularly for residential uses. But this also happens with um, sometimes commercial uses as well. So uh, there, there's one key key change. The inline additions, um, these are things that you already deal with, but outside of historic districts, we've really struggled with some of these things. Um, the planning commission, this is probably, it's one of the, the top um, special exceptions that we see year in and year out as far as numbers. Um, and it's been fairly controversial, particularly when there's a second story addition. And this is for when a building doesn't meet the current side yard setbacks mostly, but it also applies to front and rear. And so this proposal puts some brackets around what that what those can can be. And you can see on that, you probably can't read the the numbers on the bottom left, but basically that that jog that's on towards the top of the house, um, that's the footprint of a house up in the foothills that doesn't meet the setbacks. In a situation like that, that that kind of cutout area, they could they could actually expand into that and continue that building line. That's what what we're trying to do. Um, one thing that we're trying to avoid is the picture on the right where we had a this is a special exception from 10 plus years ago um, that only had a three foot side yard setback and um, they were able to get approval for um, adding a second story. So uh, mm -hmm. there would be some brackets about how much that that side yard wall could be extended uh, by a percentage um, and um, it wouldn't allow the second story to encroach. If there was a second story addition, that second story would have to meet, be set back of meet the minimum setbacks. That's a little bit of a confusing um, issue, but um, hopefully that helps. Uh, well, a lot of our special exceptions deal with non-complying buildings and how they're expanded and how they're used, actually. And so, what this a big a big chunk of these changes deal with this and and rightfully puts them in the non -com, non-conforming and non-complying building chapter. Um, for example, in some zones, if the single family zone is, isn't allowed, you need to get a conditional use for even an expansion of one of those homes, and that doesn't make much sense. And so, um, it, it would be things like that, um, allowing the replacement of non-complying um, accessory buildings, for example. And then we're moving the unit legalization process into this section as well, because it is a essentially a a determination of non-conforming use and whether that use should be is a, should be appropriately recognized or not. Um, one of the things that the planning commission wanted us to maintain is a way to uh, address front yard parking, and they wanted it to be very limited. You can see in this picture, this is a house that was built prior to any um, parking requirements in the code. And the rear yard is not accessible um, for a driveway or a vehicle by any means. Um, and so a special exception was approved for this um, to, to add basically a parking stall. And one of the arguments that the planning commission said was that there, there probably are situations where we would rather 
have this than have cars on the street or not have the ability to park a car on the street. Um, and they, part of the argument is that if other, if other properties had driveways and people could park in that same location anyway, how is this really any different from that? Um, but they recognize that, that it does have an impact on the streetscape. And so there'd be some limitations on this. Um, obviously in historic districts, it would require a, a certificate of appropriateness as well. Most of those, which it does now, and most of those are actually approved at the staff level unless um, there's some objection or, or we find some reason why we couldn't approve it. Uh, another, this is actually a massive change that we are working on. We don't have this completely finalized yet. Um, but right now you can get a special exception to put your necessary utility infrastructure to serve a development in the right of way. And it's, it's, um, especially with the rate of development we're having, it's starting to create a lot of issues within our right of way and competition for what we, what the city needs the right of way to function as. And so this change basically would say if, if you need to upgrade utilities, like add a transformer for your, your development, you need to put it on your property. You need to find a way to accommodate that. And it has to be in a location that um, the mm. utility provider can access and serve and maintain. It can't just be put someplace where they don't have options. For example, if you're building a, an apartment building, you need to have a transformer someplace more than likely on your property. If you're downtown, uh, what's happening is people are not considering that when they're getting their plans approved. And then they're coming back after the fact saying that they don't have any space for it. Or they're putting in a, in, a, in a spot where Rocky Mountain Power cannot get to it, and they have to. You know, we all know transformers fail; um, they have to be replaced. And if they can't get in there to replace it, then a building's going to lose power, and and um, it adds a. It's it's generally not, believe it or not, not the property owner who has to pay for those re repairs. It's an expense to Rocky Mountain Power. Um, but the big thing here is that it, it, it's making it very difficult for us to do just about anything in the right of way, whether it's um, conflicting with our own utilities, planting trees, putting bike lanes in, widening sidewalks, putting street lights in, are all starting to be negatively impacted by these, these giant boxes. There would still be some that are allowed um, if it's serving the broader neighborhood. So telecommunication types of things, um, those would still be allowed. They're considerably smaller than these boxes. These boxes here are actually the largest ones that we see, and they they are necessary for uh, undergrounding power. So when the power goes from above, to from power poles to being underground, there's some sort of a, a box that's needed, a junction box for that. And um, in this particular case, they were put, this is, Technically not in a right of way, but it's it was a good example of um, it's on a private street, but it's a good example of of what these look like um, and the probably the the uh, biggest that we'll ever see <laughs> type of thing. So um, that's the most significant change in all of this, um, at least from the city's from a technical perspective with the city. Uh, just a, a quick summary of the community input we've received. All 31 community councils and recognized organizations have received copies of this. We reached out to AIA Utah to get some feedback. We have had some feedback from architects, uh, particularly on the inline additions and um, those types of things. Um, one thing that we've started doing because of the pandemic is all of our open houses are digital and online and a uh, review materials at your own convenience. Um, historically, when we hold in-person open houses, we'll get a handful of people, uh, particularly for a big change like this, that's very hard to understand and very wonky and technical in nature. Um, but we've actually had 176 people visit the document that lists all of the changes, <laughs> which we thought were, was uh, whether or not they've read through it, we don't know, but, um, it's probably more people than we're getting that information when we, were, when we were meeting in person. Next steps, the planning commission will have their public hearing on this on November 18th. And then we'll, if they make a recommendation, um, we'll transmit that to the city council and we'll start that process sometime, hopefully um, in 2021. And that is, 
my presentation. Great, thank you, Nick. That was interesting and looks like a, a good direction to go. Now, are we supposed to be making uh, a recommendation or uh, taking a vote on this? What's yeah, our next step? to make a motion here. So, Ken, it says that it says that in here that we don't need to if we don't want to. We can if we want. They're not asking for it. Uh, I think David's making a move here. Well, he wants to on, make one. Is, I don't know this if, is, we, you, if we want a whole lot of discussion on this, but th this has clearly been very well thought out and vetted at the city level. I, I can think of a, a handful of um, things that I have questions about, but uh, um, I'm not sure they need to go into the public record. Um, except perhaps that some notification to neighbors, um, the whole vehicle to notify neighbors during the planning process uh, might be a good thing. But uh, I'm, I'm willing to put a forward a motion. Well, let's hang on just a second, David. Let's. I think we could use some comment here. Uh, okay. yeah. This is also advertised as a public hearing. So, um, and we do have somebody who wants to speak on on this particular item. So. Oh, very good. Then. Following procedure, we'll need to open this up to public comment. All right. Can you? All right. Yep. Um, Cindy Cromer. Oh, okay. I remember her. Hi, everybody. Um, Nick, thank you. That was an absolutely fabulous presentation, and I hope you'll post it on the website or the open house page or whatever. But that was just terrific. Um, so I'm delighted to see that the um, Landmarks Commission will retain its authority to grant additional height and modify setbacks. That has been a huge benefit. The staff put together a walking tour a little over a year ago of some of the um, buildings that have resulted. They include a multiple unit project on in the South Temple Historic District and um, projects in the avenues and the university districts and um, they're just terrific and it's very important that landmarks um, continue to have that benefit as a tool. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to share with you is that when I used to be able to talk directly with planners um, in sidebar conversations, I would ask them why they were attracted to the field of planning. Um, particularly, I would ask women who were older because this whole thing wasn't something I could do as I went through my training. Um, I have never had a planner say to me that he or she went into planning to process special exceptions or alley vacations. We really need to get those two items off of the planner's plates so that they can do what they wanted to do when they went into the profession. That's the only thing. I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Always appreciate your comments. Um, okay, does applicant want to respond to public comments? Amen. Okay, <laughs> good. We will then move into executive session. Uh, commissioners, what are your thoughts on this? Kenton, I can I can start and say, you know, bravo for, for simplifying the process. I, I still like what was uh, uh noted in our in the in the text for, for this evening's packet, you know, that special exceptions are approved by staff, planning, blah blah blah, uh, or the historic landmark. Okay, the, the ability to make exceptions to bulk and lot uh, dimensional requirements in local historic districts will be retained through the process. You know, 21A, uh, 34.2. Uh, so, so I, I, I think you know we we still maintain what what we need to, but the process is simplified. Uh, bravo! I think this is a step in the right direction. Thank you, Mike. Others? I'm I'm supportive of these changes, Ken. I think they're a great idea. Good. Agreed. All right, uh, David, did you want to make some sort of motion on this? Uh, unless Rob, Robert's got his microphone on. You have the motion. Over okay. Or <laughs> well, we can put it on one of the freshmen. Yeah. I'll make it. Cool. Okay, uh, go ahead, please, Robert. Based on this information in the staff report, the information presented and the input received from the public, 
Hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed text amendment, PLN PCM 2020-00606 Special Exception Text Amendment. Uh, Richardson seconds. Very good. We have a motion and a second to take a vote. Uh, Aiden? Approve. Babs? Approve. Uh, David? Approve. John? Yes. Mike? Approve. And Victoria. And, oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> Victoria? Yes. And last but not least, Robert. Yes. Very good. That uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. So, good, good work, Nick. Good job. Just, yeah, good job. Just real quick, I, I wanted to I wanted to acknowledge that. So we are on version 18 of this ordinance right now. Wow. Um, wow. And it has been an all hands on deck for the planning division working on this. But we've also had a tremendous amount of support from other city departments and divisions who have reviewed these to help us get things right and figure out uh, what their needs are and what what how this impacts them because it does impact so many different city divisions. So I, I wanted to acknowledge all of the effort that uh, city staff, not city just in the planning staff. division, but all the departments have have made with this. Thank you. Oh, that's a good note, Nick. Yeah, I applaud to them. And actually, just uh, in kind of closing up tonight, just like to thank planning staff who assist us prepare these great presentations and uh, work us through all these issues. Uh, you know, obviously, we couldn't do it without you, but it's really greatly appreciated. Um, so, thank you to planning staff. Are we, are you, don't we have one more item here, Mr. We, we do, we do. It is uh, other business, chairperson and vice chairperson elections. I'm stepping down from the chair position after two years and we need uh, a new chair and a new vice chair. Uh, I think typically the, the vice chair might uh, uh, exceed into the chair position, but it isn't necessarily so. Do they want uh, it? David? Well, yeah, to, <laughs> yeah. that end, to, to move this along, I, I uh, I'll move that uh, Commissioner Hyde uh, be promoted to chair and that Commissioner Vila uh, become our vice chair. Uh, Commissioners Hyde and, and Vila, what are your thoughts? Are you, uh, Robert, are you willing to? Except nomination? Willing and able. Yes, I'm willing to do that. I'm not sure it's a promotion, but uh, but I'm willing to do that. <laughs> it will double your pay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Um. <laughs> I just heard today on the news that the um, average person on the um, what is it to be an, uh, on the board of education gets paid like seventy thousand dollars a year. It's like. Well, I have been on the wrong committees my whole life. <laughs> In the world, yeah, some some giant scandal that they're getting paid a fortune, but that's here nor there. Um, I agree with this. Let's yeah. move on. Vote, yay! Thank you all. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess we get, we'll take a vote on this. Uh, all yeah. in favor, say aye. Aye. Wait a minute. I didn't ask. Wait, no, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Mike, are you are you willing to accept this nomination and serve in the uh, that position? I said I would volunteer, so yes, I will accept this this position. <laughs> Very good. Okay, in that case, we have Commissioner Hyde uh, nominated as chair, and Commissioner Vela nominated as vice chair. All in favor, raise a hand or say aye. 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 Okay. All opposed? Hearing nobody opposed? Uh, you're in charge next time, gents. Congratulations. Okay.
Well, yay to Kenton, I'm sure. Yeah. Kenton, you've done a great job, yeah. but I wouldn't know. Thanks, Babs. <laughs> and thank you to all the commissioners. It's been fun sitting up here and letting you guys sit on the full hot seat. Um, and thank you very much to our three newcomers, Aidan and John and Babs. Great, uh, great additions. Great input, great additions. I really am impressed with the research you've done and how you read through this stuff. And you actually went out on your own field trips. So uh, th this is going to be a, a good session. So thank you very much. And Robert and, and Michael, Michael, you picked a good one to start on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We. Let me just uh, say thank you to Kent. And he's, uh, I've been with him now for three years and he, uh, he does a wonderful job of, uh, of uh, great attitude, great perspective. And uh, thank you, Kent, for all your work the last number of years. Are you leaving? Thanks, Robert. It's been are, fun. You, are you leaving the commission, Kent? No. <laughs> no, I was told this summer that I, my sentence is, I think, uh, another three years. Okay. Sorry. Something like that. Okay. Um, I think our, I think David is probably the next one who's aging out of this. Okay. But I don't know how soon. You probably got another year with us, I think. I but ahead anyhow, we're all together for a while yet. Yeah. It's a good group. So, okay. Thank you to everyone. This uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Yay. See you later. Good Thank you luck and you. Godspeed. You to May we have, have a, a president before we meet again. Mm -hmm.